channel. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn Booksellers, which if you didn't know, is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're very pleased to be uh, starting off the month of, month of March with a virtual author event. And I'm very excited to tell you about this book and these authors that we're going to be speaking to in just a moment. Um, if you are interested in anything you hear tonight, the book, the authors, you can of course head to our website, majorsandquinn.com and check out the book and uh, order anything you'd like. I will drop a direct link to that book in the chat. Speaking of the chat, that is also where you can ask questions of our wonderful authors tonight. So whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, um, write in the comments any questions you have, uh, and we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So don't be shy. Any point that it occurs to you, type it in there. Um, also, just let us know where you're watching from, who you are, say hello, because um, we'll be here with you for the next few minutes. And now, please let me introduce, we're going to be listening to Dr. Sarah Davis and Evie Granville, MED, who are etiquette experts whose advice reaches hundreds of thousands of parents and caregivers each month. Their new book is Modern Manners for Moms and Dads, Practical Parenting Solutions for Sticky Social Situations uh, for Kids Zero to Five. We are in a you know new era of child rearing, um, you know, the the first generation of social media parenting, and they're going to tell us some great tips and tricks that they have and some etiquette that they would like people to know about. So again, ask your questions, and I will be back at the end to remind you to ask questions and say hello. But other than that, this is Evie and Sarah's show. Thank you so much both for being here, and have a great show. Thank you. All right, everybody. Good evening. How much do you love this bookstore backdrop here? Like that was like the first thing we saw when we were in soundcheck today and we thought, oh my God, how fun. It's like we're really in a bookstore. So welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Sarah Davis and I'm thrilled to be here with Majors and Quinn tonight and with, of course, my bestie Evie to talk all about modern manners for moms and dads. And if you didn't know, Evie was my best friend. You're going to hear all about it in a minute. So, um, my background is in education. I have a doctorate in curriculum, a master's in literacy. I've taught for many, many years, kindergarten, middle school, and currently preschool virtually, which is an adventure, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm also a mom to four kids that range in age from 10 years old to two years old. I'm a proud military spouse and also an adoptive mom. One of my babies is adopted. And so I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you tonight to share um, some of our big tips and tricks and talk to you all about social media. My name is Evie Granville. I, as you, as Sarah said, I am her best friend. I am also a mom to two girls, uh, two strong old girls, I like to say, seven and 10. And my background is in education. I've got a master's degree in secondary education. And my professional experience is in communications. So Sarah and I met years and years ago when we were brand new moms, when we were trying to figure a lot of things out. And we were constantly coming to each other with sticky situations that were always popping up unexpectedly. We thought we were really prepared for parenthood and there kept being things that would come up that would really throw us off our game. Like, how does one breastfeed in the middle of a target run? What do you do if you go into a restaurant bathroom and there is no changing table? What am I supposed to do if I'm in the middle seat during takeoff or landing on an airplane and my baby is crying and the guy next to me is giving me dirty looks? So we put our heads together. We said, we're educators. We've got to be able to figure this out. So what, what we did over the years was that we came up with a method that any parent or caregiver can use to figure out how to balance three competing needs when they're out in public with young kids their own needs, because let's face it, parents can burn out very easily. We need to think of our own needs, their child's needs, and the needs of everybody else around you, sort of society's expectations. And what we did in our, uh, in our book, Modern Manners for Moms and Dads, is to answer those questions of how do I handle this sticky situation so that while there was no guide when we were new moms, we have prepared one for you. And we are so excited to be able to talk to you today about social media because let's face it, 
when our parents were raising young kids, there was no concern about social media. It didn't exist. For Sarah and I, we came up during the age of social media. I think Sarah told me she had some very early social media profiles. Yes, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Before Facebook, pre-Facebook? Pre-Facebook, that's right. <laughs> So trying to raise kids, it's, with us being the first generation, trying to navigate both parenting and having the social media access, we have a lot of new challenges that we want to be able to start to touch on this evening. And I'm going to let Sarah dive into some of that with us tonight now. Okay, so let's talk about why social media and why it's so special. And I want you to think back to your childhood. And if you're a very young mom, you may this might be something that you've always known. But if you're more on the millennial side of moms like me, and maybe a little bit Evie, she's a little younger than me, you grew up with out social media. You kind of grew up with it. And, and as you got older and older, you had opportunities to curate your own brand. So you were the first person to put your likeness on the internet. You were the first person to do that. You got to decide, how do I want my life and my picture, hi Judy, and all of these things to be on social media? How do I want that? I get to curate it. So as our life went on, maybe we got married, maybe we got a special job, we shared it. We had a baby, we shared it because it was just part of our life, right? It was just the next thing that happened. But somewhere along the line, that baby became its own story and not necessarily a piece of yours, but their own. And as you started to put pictures of your baby doing all of their firsts, you started creating their brand, their likeness. Instead of them having the chance to do it for the first time like you did, you did it for them. And it's not a bad thing. There were a lot of people who we interviewed when we were writing the book that said, actually, I really am doing this on purpose. I want my child to be able to go back and see their baby book digitally to go back through all these profiles and say like, oh, I did that on, on a Tuesday in March. We went to strawberry farm. That's super fun. How cool that we took a picture of that. And then there were other parents who said like, no, 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 I don't want so much on there. So this is a very special thing that we have, this ability to create the brand that will eventually grow with our child. But it's also a big responsibility because we have to decide what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate. But before we go into that, I want to talk about the benefits of social media. Why do we share on social media? What are the benefits? What are the things that we gain? Because there is so much. And some of the things that we talk about in the book is that people talk about kids sleep, nutrition. People ask questions about discipline, behavior problems, daycare and preschool. In fact, a University of Michigan survey said that 72% of parents said that sharing made them feel less alone. Mm -hmm. Of course it does. Instead of having to sit at home and wonder all day or drive all the way to the library for information, you just type it into that internet search box and you've got a hundred answers right at your fingertips. And then you go on social media and you say, hey, do you agree with this? This is what I found. And then all your friends who you have curated on your friend list will give you answers. So of course you don't feel less, al of course you don't feel alone. You feel like you have that community at your fingertips. Big, big plus right there. But sometimes we can overshare thinking that we're asking for help, right? Okay, we receive connection. We receive community and support. We get this validation that we're in this together. Because when do we get validation as parents, especially if we're at home with them? No one's there to say, hey, great job picking up that playroom. You did a nice job there. Way to go on toilet training today. But if we share it, somebody will clap for us. You know, yeah, we can call our friend, but if we share it on Facebook, we're going to get like a hundred people clapping for us and that feels really good. So there are reasons, there are things that we get out of it as well. And another thing that's quite interesting is actually there has been studies that show that healthcare, there has been created this idea of peer to peer healthcare in social media. So it's actually been shown to lessen some of those knowledge gaps in terms of healthcare. We can go online, we can go in a social media group and ask the healthcare question and have the same resources at our fingertips that anybody else would as long as they have an internet connection. So no longer do we have to go to the library or to a bookstore to find information. It's right there, which gives us much more knowledge than our parents ever had when they were raising us. They called, called, called to three friends and got three answers. We can get 200 in five minutes. So mm. why wouldn't we use it? There are tons of benefits to it. So we are not going to sit here tonight and tell you don't share on social media. There are plenty of research-based benefits to do that. What we're here tonight to talk, to talk about 
is the things that we want you to think about along the way. And Evie is going to go right into that with one of our favorite concepts, which is consent. Yeah, this is complicated because as Sarah said, as we post about our kids, we're telling a story about them. We're telling a story about their life. And we have to really be thinking before we're hitting share on any of these posts, even if it's a quick post about an activity, a cute photo, a video, because the thing is, it's a little different than when our parents were raising us. And if you picked up the phone or you were at a play group and you shared a story about your kid, it sort of stayed where you put it. It could possibly spread, be spread through gossip, but the likelihood that it was going to reach hundreds or thousands or millions of people, it just wasn't there. Now, when we post something on the internet, internet about our child, we really don't know how far it's going to spread. Even if you have your social media accounts super but buttoned up, really tight security, there is that slim possibility that somebody in your network is going to take a screenshot and share something. Even if you post something and then you think, oh, should I have posted that? You go back and delete it. Once you post it online, you cannot be assured that it is going to stay where you think it is meant to. <laughs> so the stories we post about our kids online really do live on forever. So that is good encouragement for us to think really carefully before we post. And we have heard from our audience that parents worry. They, they do think before they post because they worry that somebody might take a photo or a video and do something with it that was not their original intention. And I'm sure you've seen memes created, you know, with a picture of a little kid doing something silly or adorable. And they were created without that parent's consent. That was not why that parent posted that kid of their, you know, that wonderful photo of their child in their high chair. It wasn't to create a meme, but that's what in uh, that's what was happening with it. So the other thing we want to be mindful of is that as we tell the story about our child, <laughs> we want to make sure that we are talking about them in a way that makes them their own character in their own story. Sarah sort of touched on this. They're not a supporting character in our story. So the more we share about them, the bigger brand we are creating for them. And it can sound sort of silly to say it that way, but that is in essence what's happening. We are creating a story about them. And most of the time with young kids, for the people who are in our audience, for parents of kids ages zero to five, which was our audience for this book, we really can't get consent. We really can't say to an infant, a toddler, even a preschooler, may I post this photo of you? <clears throat> with a young child, they simply don't have any concept of what we mean by that. Even with a five-year-old, we can say to them, can I take a photo of you? Yes or no. And then it becomes, can I share it? Well, what does that mean? Am I going to send it to grandma and grandpa? Am I going to post it on Facebook? Am I going to put it on Instagram? And then what's the spread? Like who's going to see it and what can happen with it? And because we can't get our children's consent for this, we have to be extra responsible about the, the ways that we share their likeness and their story. So when we think about consent, it's a little bit muddy. We do the best we can. And sometimes we make mistakes. Sarah and I share stories in this book about instances when maybe we didn't handle things the right way or in retrospect, we wish we had done them differently. And it's okay. But it is a question we want to have sort of percolating in the back of our mind, because in the long run, we want to make more good choices than bad. And we want our children to look back at the story that we created about them and feel good about it and not feel like we somehow overshared, took advantage of them in a, you know, a vulnerable moment. We really want to be careful about what we're saying about them, especially since we just share so much. 90% of kids have been featured on social media by their second birthday. That is nearly every single child. And if I'm being honest, I think it's probably a higher number than that. Most kids have some sort of information online and we wanna make sure that as our kids age, with us being the first generation facing this, our kids will be the first generation facing whatever content their parents have posted about them online. We want them to feel good about what they find in 10, 15, 20 years. Okay, so keeping that in mind, let's think about what we necessarily, you know, what, what can sharing, how can sharing impact our kids? So we all say social media is a highlight reel, right? Lots of people just put the beautiful things. And then we have another philosophy that says, no, you should put the real life stuff on there. You shouldn't just, shouldn't just put the highlight reel. Well, if you think about your kids and say your child is having a really bad day and they're crying 
they're having a temper tantrum, they're really emotional. You snap a picture and you put that picture on Facebook or something and ask for advice. I need help with my child. He's really having a hard day. You think that I'm doing a good thing here. I need some help from my friends. So I'm going to post this and a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So I'm going to post a picture of what's actually happening in my, in my house. Well, it might be okay to ask your friends for help when your child's having a meltdown or, you know, you, you have a curated trusted network of people that you want to reach toward, but it might not be okay to include a photo. Why? Because a child who's having a tantrum, a child who's having an emotional outburst is having a really hard time. They're really struggling with something emotionally. It's not fair to go and put that on social media for everybody to see. My rule is if you wouldn't want a picture of yourself doing that thing, don't take a picture and put it up your child. So, you know, if the next time you're having a meltdown and your partner, your life partner's talking to you and they take a picture and put it on social, you're gonna be like, what are you doing? Of course, because it's a private moment. You don't want to share it. Your, your child probably doesn't either. Another one, toilet time. We are very proud of our kids when they potty train. It is a very difficult process for the parent and we want to celebrate it when it's over. So a lot of times you'll see a little picture of a potty and a little baby on the potty. I am here tonight to tell you to save that for the baby book. Because <laughs> nobody wants a picture of themselves on the toilet when they're in, you know, 10 years looking for a job and they start Googling themselves and, oh, look, there's me potty training. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Another one would be, you know, a child sleeping. And this is one that's kind of interesting because a lot of people like to put pictures of their children sleeping on social because they're adorable and angelic. And while that might be okay if you have an infant, if you have a child who's actually old enough to understand that you're taking a picture of them sleeping, you probably shouldn't post it. Again, a vulnerable, private moment that we don't necessarily want to share. And some of you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I do this. And we've had clients that we talk to say like, oh my gosh, I do this all the time. Am I horrible? No. As Evie said, we all make mistakes. The, the, the idea is to think about it, to think about, is this the picture that I want? Do I think my child will be okay with this in 10 years? Can I just take it down? Can I, can I send it? Can I text it to a few people who really will appreciate it? Same thing goes for children who are feeling sick. Private moment, not necessarily a moment that you want to share. Or if your child gets in trouble at school, it might not be the time to tell that story to 200 of your closest friends. Because it might embarrass them later, you know? And this is, again, goes back to that idea that your child is their own entity. They're their own person. They're not necessarily just the supporting actor in your story. They have their own, and they may ha they have the right to tell it the way that they want to. I, I Going into this, the thing that's even funnier is if you think about all of what I just said, 75% of parents think that other parents overshare. <laughs> So when we read that statistic, we were like, huh, oh, well. <laughs> Who are these other parents? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'll close with that. On the other hand, that idea of oversharing is really pervasive, right? And and what we share on social media, whether we consider it oversharing or not, can have a huge effect on our relationships not just with our children, but with friends and family too, because there are some big faux pas that we see coming up over and over again when it comes to sharenting. And we have a section in our book about some of the, the cast of characters you might find online. And I am sure that if you are a parent with young kids, some of these are gonna ring true for you, or most of them are really gonna ring true for you. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play a little game. I'm going to read from the book, which is this section called Don't Be That Parent. Um, and it's about the people that we might meet on social media and what they might say underneath a post and why it might not be the best etiquette. And then after I read it, Evie is going to give us a better option. So if, if you want to say this comment, don't say it my way, say it her way, but we're going to show you <laughs> the way in the book because it's funny. So the first friend, commenter that we will see on social is called the one upper. So let's see if anybody knows anybody like the one upper. So here we go. You might, okay, here we go. You know, when a brand new mom posts about how tired she is, well, this mom will respond with something like, just wait until you have to. <laughs> okay. 
Of course, you could be more tired if you have two young kids, but that doesn't replace the fact that we're talking about a mom who is newly experiencing motherhood, who is fully exhausted by it. So instead of trying to one up her, take this opportunity to have that message resonate with you and say, oh, I remember that time so well. It was such a difficult time. You've just got to get through it. I'm sure you're exhausted. Let me know if there's any way I can help. That is a much more loving way to handle it. And if you know a one-upper, don't say who, don't name names, but go ahead and feel free to put it into the comments that you're familiar with this character. <laughs> okay, number two, the passive aggressive perfect parent. So a dad posts a photo of his kids having ice cream and this commenter responds with, so cute. My kids wouldn't eat that even if I tried since we don't eat sugar. Hashtag we love healthy food. <laughs> Just save it. Put a little <laughs> thumbs up on it. Give it a heart. So cute. Just love it and be done. We do not have to compare our family's choices to another family's choices or eating habits or otherwise. Okay, number three, the professor. So they see somebody with a child in a car seat, but the straps are incorrect. And how many times have this has, now this is a big one because this has happened a lot. You know, somebody might post a photo of a child in a crib with stuffed animals around them or blankets or it's a right. child in a car seat with straps that are not, and you're like, do I say something? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Do I say something? Well, we're gonna cover it right now. Never fear, here we go. So the professor might say, you might want to refer back to your owner's manual so you can adjust those straps correctly. Hashtag no better, do better. <laughs> oh gosh. It's really hard to remain friends with people like this, isn't it? Because it's really yeah. hard to remain friends with people like this. It really is. This is when you click unfriend. Okay. So <laughs> the thing with this is. I, I know I have experienced this at points in my life when I saw something online that made me think, oh, I really don't feel good about this. And the, the example in my life was a child that I saw in a car seat with super loose straps, just like really way too loose. And this was an infant and this was a mother to, that I knew really well. So instead of taking that approach of publicly shaming her, referring her back to her owner's manual, I sent her a private message and I said, please know that this is coming from a place of love. And most of my close friends do know that I have like a serious, um, a serious thing about car seat safety. And so she knew that about me. And I said, please know this is coming from a place of love. I saw the cute picture you posted of so-and-so. And I just want to make sure that he normally rides with his car seat straps tighter than the way they appeared in that photo. Can you just please reassure me? I'm having a moment of paranoia. So it's that private message. It's that please know I'm coming from a place of love. It's the tone and it's the opportunity to, to a little bit of self-deprecation never hurts either to just say, you know how I am about car seats. And she reassured me, oh no, the car was parked. We had loosened the strap so that he wasn't going to be crying while we were stationary. He does not ride that way. Whew, thank goodness. But you can say something. It's the tone and doing it privately. And also, I would caution you not to say something to somebody who is an experienced parent, right? So if we're talking about a, a first-time parent and there's like a SIDS risk or, you know, a serious risk of injury, okay, maybe depending upon your relationship, you can say something privately. If we're talking about a mom of three, you got to assume she knows, right? A parent that has lots of experience, a grandparent, then probably we need to just trust their judgment. Okay, next, the hijacker. Okay, here we go. The hijacker <laughs> sees a photo of a kid at the beach for the first time, and they chime in with, yes, us too, complete with three photos of their baby decked in head-to-toe Lily Pulitzer. Hmm. <laughs> go ahead and comment, but not with your own photo. You can say, we enjoyed a beautiful day at the beach too, so wonderful to get the babies into the sunshine. But if you are gonna be posting photos, you're just taking it too far. Go ahead and do that on your own thread and let your, your creativity and your photos fly over there. Save it for your own stuff. Okay, and the last one we're gonna share is the can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> so this person, every post is about their child. They have at least three photos of their baby in his car seat just from last Tuesday. And they document every last moment from his messy diaper to his first smile, all for the world to comment on. So, you know, again, this is that oversharing thing. It's 
there's an opportunity to share little glimpses into our lives. But if we're documenting the same event with a hundred photos, it gets to be too much, it gets overwhelming. And, and or even if you're documenting several things over the course of the day, if somebody's feed becomes filled with your life, it can feel a little bit overwhelming and sort of like, okay, we get it, we get it. We see what you're doing here, that's wonderful. So you just wanna curate, you wanna think about, are these the moments that are most valuable to me? And stop to say, why am I sharing this? Am I looking for validation? Am I looking for a pat on the back? And if the last three or four posts were all for that same reason, it might be time to cut things down a little bit. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to talk about something really interesting, which is social media. Is social media invited to parties and play games? Now, this may be not as much of an issue now during COVID, but actually it might be because there are people who will have bubbles and they're having, you know, play dates and all that stuff with their bubbles. And so a lot of times those pictures of things show up online. Mm -hmm. If you have a play date, it's really hard not to take pictures. Kids are adorable. They're playing together. It's so much fun. You want to document all these wonderful things that are happening. Is it okay to share that picture of someone else's child on social media? My answer is always, you have to ask for permission first. You can ask for like long-term permission. Hey, is it okay if I do this? And then maybe your friend would say, of course, it's fine. And then you never have to ask again. Mm -hmm. But each time you talk to a new parent, you really do have to ask. Because if you don't, you are taking that child's privacy and putting it into a whole different level of a whole different um, profile. And that may not be something that the parent wants. I have, I am very private with my kids and their likenesses on uh, social media. So I have been that parent that's called up someone else and said, hey, great play date, great photos, take them down. I don't want them up there. And, you know, everybody has been awesome about it and said like, oh, sorry, I totally didn't even realize. I know, because why would you realize? You might not think about it that way or like, oh, well, I didn't tag you. That's okay, thanks, please take it down. For me, I don't want any photos unless I've chosen where to put them. Other people might not care. If there's no tag, they probably will say, that's okay, no problem. But I am continuously the one that doesn't sign the little release forms that does that says, and I want, I don't want my child's photos on these things because I want to make those decisions. That is up to the parent. It's not up to the person who hosts the play date. So I, you etiquette wise, you do always have to ask for permission. Other reasons could be things like, if you have a party and don't necessarily invite everybody in the class, but then you take pictures and there's only a few kids left out, they're gonna, they might see it and that might hurt somebody's feelings. So as much as you wanna share the photos of a child's party on social, and you can, we're not saying that you can't, but you do need to get permission first and kind of think about some of those effects, those long-term effects that might, might be at other people. And you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, how we can balance the needs of other people and the needs of kind of what we want when we're sharing a big life event on social media towards the end of the presentation. Um, but if, if you are the parent that needs to ask someone to take something down, really good language would be something like, thank you so much for the play day today. It was so much fun. We had a great time. I did notice that you put some photos on Instagram and we're really uncomfortable with that in my family. Would you mind taking them down? But please text them to me because they're super cute. And that's it. You know, that's all you have to say. I love that. Um, you know, something, a question came up one time from our audience about what about grandparents? Do grandparents need to be asking for permission? What do you think, Sarah? Yes, I do. Yeah. And that might be the one where you, you know, you said that sometimes you ask permission once and then you sort of have like carte blanche to go forward with whatever directive you've been given. Right. Grandparents right. are a great example of that. Mm -hmm. So, one of my favorite, favorite things about this book and what makes it so unique and very much not a coffee table etiquette book is that it is built around a framework. Sarah and I have answered hundreds of reader and podcast listener questions about sticky parenting situations. And what we realized over the years was that there were three types of parents that sort of emerged. And I hinted at this earlier when I talked about balancing your needs, your child's needs and everybody else's. The framework and the quiz that we developed that lives on our website, and we can pop that link into uh, the chat a little bit later, it gives you an idea of your parenting personality. And your parenting personality 
is your visceral reaction to situations, not just out in public, but even in your own home, how you respond to things on social media. Do you naturally, instinctively prioritize your own needs? Because let's say you're a mom of four and you're gonna burn out otherwise. Your child's needs, because maybe you're a first time mom and you're just very engrossed in keeping your child safe and healthy and happy, or the needs and expectations of everybody else throughout society. So once you take that quiz that lives on our website and inside our book, Modern Manners for Moms and Dads, you get labeled as either a crescent parent, a constellation parent, or a fireball parent. And you can see that we stuck with this solar system, solar system theme. Then as you go through the book, as we talk about different environments where sticky situations might come up, environments like school buildings, when you're entertaining, when you're hosting a birthday party, when you're interacting with people on social media, we talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each one of these parenting perspectives. So we wanted to give you a little hint about that today, because if you've, take any, if you've taken a quiz, a personality quiz, like say the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs, you know that the insights that come from understanding your personality type can be incredibly valuable. And so that is built into this book. It is not a simple list of do's and don'ts. It provides a method for and a lens to see your actions and behaviors and eventually grow to discover which um, situations really call for that parenting perspective and when you might want to back away from it a little bit. I am a crescent parent for the record and Evie is a constellation parent. So um, we're able to kind of talk through those a lot. And this, this framework came out a lot of our, of our conversations that we had over the years where we would react differently to things too and think about like, well, why did we, you know, we're so close, but then why would we react differently? Why would we think have different priorities in this situation? So the quiz is a really, really fun way to kind of understand why you make the choices you do. And we always encourage people to have their partners take it or their best friends take it because it is really eye opening. Like, oh, my gosh, that's why you always want to, <laughs> you know, um, you never want to let the kids touch anything. Go to a store. Oh, and I don't care. But you do. It's because you're a constellation. I'm a crescent. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so we see some of this come out in social media, too. Right, Sarah, the way people Absolutely. do their charity. Well, absolutely. So when we're when we're working in, with social media, crescents like me are tend to be the really protective ones. Oh, no, I don't want that photo on there. Oh, no, I, I'm going to decide I'm going to control it. And crescents might not have a problem telling somebody to take it down. Mm -hmm. But someone like Evie, who's a constellation, who really, really worries about what other people think, would have she would be calling me and asking me, I don't like this photo, but I don't know how to tell them to take it down. Oh, like, oh, that's easy. Do you want me to call them? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So a constellation like me on social media is going to be slow to post, really overanalyze. How are other people going to feel about this? If, you know, even leaving comments, sometimes, you know, if there's a post about, about a situation that is more delicate, perhaps a death, I might spend 20 to 30 minutes agonizing about picking the exact right words. So a constellation, that tendency to prioritize the needs of others it's not just in social situations. It's not just in my own home. It even affects the decisions that I make in so, on social media. And then the third category of parent is the fireball. And Sarah's got a little bit of fireball in her. We all have a little bit of each of these perspectives. Mm -hmm. And the fireball parent is the one who tends to be the more experienced parent, tends to be the one who recognizes that they cannot pour from an empty cup. So they instinctively will prioritize their own needs. And Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about fireball behavior on social media? So a fireball, a fireball is going to be the one posting all the funny, relatable memes. They'll be the one that's super entertaining online. Um, and they don't glamorize or romanticize life as a parent. So if you have friends who are posting reality on, on social, that's probably a fireball because they're like, listen, I don't need to pretend that everything's perfect. I'm not, this is not rose colored. This is life. It's okay. It's okay if it's not perfect. And that's fantastic. We all need those in our lives. But sometimes fireballs can get a little bit too uh, relaxed with their boundaries on social media. And sometimes they might post things that are a little bit inappropriate. So they're the ones that sometimes have to look back and think, well, maybe that photo of the child on the toilet was not quite the best idea. So. so hopefully we've given you some ideas this evening for strategies you can use to sort of analyze your own social media behavior mm -hmm. by determining your parenting perspective, whether you are a crescent, fireball, or parent, 
Again, the quiz is, lives in the book. It also lives on our website. And also some uh, food for thought. You know, we all make mistakes. We all uh, choose to share something and think, oh, should I have done that? About ourselves, about our kids, our families. Mm -hmm. And so this is not meant to be, uh, you know, a disparaging conversation in any way, but an opportunity to sort of analyze how do we want to do things going forward mm -hmm. so that we're making really conscious decisions that looking back in 10 or 20 years when our kids are getting to the age where they have to go on dates or, you know, might be teased at school by teenagers or maybe going to a job interview, that we feel good about the story we started for them online when they were little. At this point, we're happy to take any questions. If there's any questions that you might have about anything we talked about, but also if you have a sticky situation that you want to run by us on social media, we're happy to chat about that as well. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yes. How have you seen isolation and quarantine affecting parents' social media decisions? Well, you know, something that's really interesting about that is I said in the beginning of the talk that parents reach out for um, validation and advice on social media, and that has become gigantic during the pandemic because people have so much less time face to face with people that they really do rely strongly and in some ways social media has replaced our social lives mm -hmm. and so people have gotten broader people have gotten braver with what they've shared they've gotten more vulnerable evie and i have talked about this multiple times that parents are getting really vulnerable talking about themselves not necessarily their kids but saying that they themselves are overwhelmed the schooling is too much, the just responsibility and the weight of everything is too much. And that that's okay. You know, being able to reach out to your trusted network and tell your own story of how you're feeling, that might be the thing that gets you through the day. And that's wonderful. Absolutely. I think it's also raising a lot of new concerns about how young kids are interacting with social media. You know, my kids are doing things that I would never have dreamed of letting them do text messaging and FaceTime calls without parental supervision and, you know, Facebook Messenger and all of the th these things that I thought I was not going to let them do until they were older. They're, I mean, the pandemic necessitates these things. They're ways of reaching out, they're ways of communicating. So it raises new concerns as well, not just in terms of the sharing we do, but the sharing we're the sharing we're allowing our kids to do online. Even with young kids, I, I you know, have nieces and nephews who have uh, social media access for this very purpose, so that they can communicate with their cousins. And so here we are, <laughs> right. new territory. Absolutely. We like to say that the etiquette has not gone away during the pandemic. It's just no. changed. It's completely changed. And then you know, you get photos of a play date you might have had put on social media and then somebody writes underneath oh are you being safe have you been tested have you been vaccinated is this in your bubble and then you're like oh my gosh you know and that might be a conversation you want to take offline you know mm -hmm. um oh jill thank you so much she says you both have such wonderful and thought-provoking insight my second is what do you feel about making a social media for a child I have a friend who made a separate facebook page for a young child to share all the photos of him there i mm -hmm. actually in the adoptives world know a lot of adoptive moms who have done this with um, the triad. So what that means is like there, a triad and adoption is there's three people. There is the birth, well, or six, there's the birth parents, there's the adoptive parents, and there is the child. And so a lot of people in open adoption will do exactly this. We'll create a very, very small private Facebook page just for the parents who are involved and share photos right there because it creates, it's small, it's private, it's, it's, it's closed. And it's just for those people. Um, so I think that if your friend is keeping it really, really small and using it as sort of like what we would have done with, you know, Shutterfly albums years mm -hmm. ago, you know, kind of made me think of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay. Yeah, another way I've seen parents do it is with Facebook groups. So mm -hmm. you can really control who's coming in and who's accessing the materials. I mean, it, it's still, I certainly still wouldn't be putting photos in there of a naked child, for instance, mm -hmm. something, you know, there are certain things that just don't belong online anywhere because they can, Anything we post on Facebook, rest assured, somebody else could hack into it if they really wanted to. So there are certain things I would just say should never live online, regardless of where we're putting them and who, you know, page, group, strict access. They probably just shouldn't be online at all. Good question, Jill. Yeah, thanks. That's a great one. 
I think we're all, you know, struggling to find the answers to these questions. Sarah and I share stories in the book about how our own parenting philosophies differ a little bit in terms of what we share on social media and even what we tell our kids about what we're sharing on social media. Do you want to say where you stand with that a little bit, Sarah? Oh, wait. Here, hang on one second. We got another question. And your advice on how to communicate with other parents, it seems like there needs to be a baseline relationship friendship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What about your parenting group situations where you're interacting with strangers? Mm. So ideally when you're in a parenting group, you would be there for a combined interest, right? You know, parents of babies, parents of attachment parenting, whatever you're in there for. But one of the things that I think we mentioned is that a lot of times parents or anybody really online has this false sense of like security that they can say things that they wouldn't say in person because they're behind a screen. Yeah. And that's something that we really want to watch for. You know, if this isn't something you would say to someone's face, even the tone, and you really have to watch the tone on, on when you type something because people who don't know you that might not know you're sarcastic yeah. might read that as very rude or use capital letters or you don't use enough emojis and people don't realize you're kidding or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, you definitely want to come across kind because guess what? Those comments can be screenshotted and shared anywhere. Oh, yes. So, you know, not only do you have to make sure you're going to say it to their face that you would do that, but also I would even take it a step further and say even be kinder because you don't want to give people any reason to be like, oh, what a, you know what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, I, I interpreted this question a slightly different way. I was thinking the question was about if you go to a play group and you don't know all the parents there and mm. say somebody snaps a photo of your kid and you discover that it's online, now what? Mm. I know what you would do. I know what I would do. I would call, I would find out who's in charge and call them and tell them to take it down. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, what I, I would do because I'm a crescent and yeah. I'm also a military wife and that's been the rule. Just, that's just the rule. Yeah. But what would I you think, do? I, I think I would do the same. Like if I really felt strongly about it, I would figure out how to contact a stranger and say, I know you shared this um, with the best intentions, but I'm not comfortable with that photo of my child being posted online. Would you mind removing it? On the other hand, I will say, and this is like a little hypocritical, but if it goes on a story like Instagram stories that disappear, I'm a little less, I'm a little less careful with those. Like if I mm -hmm. see somebody that we, before COVID, that we saw, and they post a, a picture of my child and their child on a story, mm -hmm. I'm less apt to tell them to take it down because I know in 24 hours it's gonna go away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going back what I was, to what I was saying earlier about the different philosophies we have about what we tell our children, our own children about social media. You know, Sarah and I both have 10 year olds. Sarah and I both have eight year olds. So despite the fact that we have big kids and Sarah has younger ones too, we say different things to them. We share different messages with them about what social media is for and, and how it can be used. Mm -hmm. Yep. So my children don't necessarily know what Facebook is at this age. Um, if I take a picture, I, I might say like, hey, can I share this? If it's of their face. If it's not of their face, I'll share it and I won't ask. Mm -hmm. If it is of their face, then I will say like, hey, can I share this with some of our friends? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And that's about as far as I go. Um, but I don't ever tell them the comments. I don't tell them the likes. I don't want them to think about it in terms of that. If I text it to grandparents or to Evie or someone that's really close to them in their life, then I might say like, oh, she wrote back. She loved your forward roll or she loved your cookies that you made or whatever. So that they know that that is like, I texted it to that person. But my 10 year old, he's 10. He'll say to me, don't share that. Uh -huh. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to take, are you going to send that to anybody? Because if you're not, Can you, you just take my picture. photo. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, fine. And then I, and then I don't, you know, and my kids have slightly more information. I mean, they just by virtue of looking over my shoulder have noticed that mm -hmm. uh, when a photo gets posted, it gets likes and it gets comments. And then that's a really tricky conversation to have with young kids about what is the intent behind these comments and how many likes does a photo get and what does that really mean? Because we certainly don't want our kids to see us post a photo, especially young kids, and then be coming back and say, ooh, well, how many likes do I have? <gasps> Did anybody comment? Because then we're sending them a really tricky message about the uses of social media and getting them to live for likes, right? We really, really want to avoid that, especially with little kids in, in for our audience members for this book, Zero to Five, 
really ideally kids this age should be sheltered from most of that because it is a very confusing message and it's hard for them to piece together what is the value of a like or a comment and how concerned should I be with it? As adults, we can say, okay, I don't, you know, it's nice, but I don't define myself by it. For younger kids, that is a much more slippery slope. They have done studies on like the loneliness of parents of tweens and teens, because when you have a baby, it's, you know, everybody shares pictures of babies, you know, it's so cute. But then as they get older and you start to ask for consent and they start to say no, your world of sharing them gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you no longer can necessarily even celebrate them online because they don't want you to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to have that trusted network of curated friends that you can maybe text and say like, oh, don't show anybody this, but I just have to share with you, he won this today or whatever. Look at his home run. Um, because you'll, if, you, if you actually start looking now, the majority of people who share are sharing babies and toddlers, you know? Absolutely. I see we have a comment from Jill and it says, my child is three and a half years old. I asked him today if I could take a picture and he said, no, before this conversation, I might just take it anyway and share it. But now I will try and respect him a little more. Well, Jill, thank you for saying that. I mean, we certainly are trying to give everybody some food for thought. We're not standing up here in our eyes saying we've never you know, done things that we later thought, oh, I'm not sure if we should have done that. Yeah. We're all figuring this out as we go. And that's why we feel like this is such an incredibly important conversation to be having right now. That's why one of the chapters in a book about modern manners for moms and dads is devoted exclusively to our social media lives. And it's especially important right now during the pandemic, because for so many of us, the vast majority of our social life exists online right. in these social media platforms where we want to be making good choices for our kids and also for ourselves because the decisions that we make on social media do have real world implications for mm -hmm. sure. So thank you for uh, taking our advice instead, <laughs> thinking about some of the pieces of feedback that we're offering tonight is food for thought. Any I hope plans? so. Okay. Ideally, ideally, this was a series, right? So we had yeah. zero to five, and then maybe later we'll do <laughs> five to ten. <laughs> to be honest, in my heart, the next book I would really love to write is a, is a much more in-depth look at the parenting perspectives, because the more we speak with parents about this framework and uh, even researchers, um, we're hearing that this is something that is very needed and the sort of paradigms around parenthood and the other frameworks that have been created are sort of one dimensional, a little bit outdated. And there's a lot of room for new conversations about the challenges that parents these days face. So I'm excited about diving into that more as well. Absolutely. And I'll well, tell you what, writing a book with your best friend is, a, is an adventure. It's one of those <laughs> things where it's like, we had to have lots of philosophical talks before we even started writing of, you know, okay, let's make sure we give each other compliments before we knock each other down. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we had to have a lot of rules for how we were gonna engage on this. And, um, you know, also a lot of the editing and like polishing up the writing happened during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we were at home with young kids and it was a lot of really asking our kids to, believe in this dream that we had. It's, you know, it's hard for little kids to understand that you're sitting, your mom's sitting in front of a computer all day and it's going to produce a book, you know, like a physical item, but they were wonderful and very patient. And our kids obviously taught us so much of what we wrote into this book. So they did. They did. the book is dedicated to them and we're, we're grateful yeah. for their, their help. And their finally kids. arrived. I remember my three kids were so excited and they all like wanted me to sign it, my older ones, and it was so cute. And then my five-year-old kept looking through it and like, I see my sight words. <laughs> and I just thought that was so cute. It is so cute, absolutely. We had to sign some books over here to young children as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been so fun. We want to thank again, Majors and Quinn for hosting us this evening for this talk on sharenting. We hope we have given you some food for thought and we really hope you will pick up a copy of our book, Modern Manners for Moms and Dads. This is a really practical guide to figuring out how to balance your needs, your child's and everyone else's so that you can build your confidence, 
uh, character and connections. Mm -hmm. We would love to be able to connect with you through social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Evie and Sarah. And um, you can also hop into our awesome Facebook group, Talking Modern Manners for Moms and Dads. And last but not least, we have a podcast by the same name, Modern Manners for Moms and Dads, where you can submit questions and hear us doing exactly this sort of banter back and forth as we work through sticky social situations on a weekly basis. So please do support your local bookstore. And um, thank you again to Majors and Quinn. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, this is super, super informative. I hope those of you who are watching are are feeling uh, like you're inspired and uh, have some good topics to, to mull over. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to pop back on and say that uh, the book can be found at majorsandquinn.com. The link is there in the chat. Um, and uh, if you are in the Minneapolis or St. Paul area, Majors and Quinn is open for limited in-store browsing. And so if you wanted to get your books in the store, you can absolutely do that. Come and see us. We're open 10 to 7 daily. Uh, wear your mask, of course. And we have copies in the store. But otherwise, the website is uh, the simplest and fastest way to get your copy. Uh, thank you both so much. If this, uh, if you have people who weren't able to watch this live, just know that the video will continue to live here on our Facebook page and YouTube channel, so you can send people uh, our way and they can check it out. Thanks wonderful. so much, and have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you.